This is lecture two on Kant's philosophy of the self in the critique of pure reason. Uh, before I start the lecture, uh, there's one mistake I have to uh, correct. At the end of lecture one, two weeks ago, I, uh, I referred to uh, Kant's remarks on things in themselves and things in space. Uh, when Kant says things outside us, he really means things in space, not in thing, things in themselves. And I said, Kant said that at the uh, A deduction, but actually he said that in the A parologism, I mean, he said that in A373, A3, and uh, as you know, the uh, transcendental deduction of the categories and uh, parologism of reason are the only two parts of the critique of pure reason he rewrote for the second edition. So what Kant said in the uh, parologism, I said he said in the uh, A deduction. So I'm sorry about that. Well, I'll talk about this, uh, what he said in A373 later on in this lecture. Now, as I said, I, I will give you uh, eight lectures on, on the critique because my thesis, Kant's philosophy of self, has eight chapters. So I, uh, I'm going to read chapter by chapter. So the two weeks ago in lecture one, I talked about lecture one. So today I'm talk, I mean, I talked about the uh, chapter one. So today I'm going to talk about chapter two. But before I go on to uh, chapter two, I want to uh, say a few more things about, about uh, chapter one. Now, I assume you have the, uh, my thesis with you, Kant's philosophy of self, which was, uh, uh, has been on internet since April 5th, 1987. And as of today, 6,505 people have downloaded it. So I suppose you're one of those 6,000 6, people who have uh, read my thesis. And uh, on page three of Kant's philosophy of the self, I said, <clears throat> although the two men's interpretations are contradictory with Kant's view, now, those two men are P.F. Strauss and H.J. Payton. <clears throat> a few passages in the first critique on the prolegomena can be used to support them. The passage is as follows. Now, this, this, is, uh, this quote too is from uh, prolegomena. It says, And we, indeed, rightly considering the object of sense as mere appearances, confess thereby that they are based upon a thing in itself, though we know not thing as it is in itself, but only know its appearances, the way in which our senses are affected by this unknown something. I mean, this passage, it sounds like uh, appearances are real, the appearance of things in themselves. There must be a... Uh, uh, each phenomenon is the appearance of uh, its corresponding noumenon. He also say, doubtless, indeed, there are intelligible entities corresponding to the sensible entities. This is quote three. Then in quote four, it says, what other thing in itself underlies the appearance of matter, perhaps uh, after all may not be so heterogeneous in character. Now, those are the three passages I quoted from the uh, prolegomena and the critique of pure reason. And it sounds like if he says, if Kant says, indeed there are intelligible entities corresponding to the sensible entities, he sounds like, for instance, the, uh, uh, the desk in front of me is the uh, phenomenal desk. This desk is the appearance of a numeral desk. I mean, if Kant says there are intelligible entities corresponding to sensible entities, maybe that's how he, he, 
he means some people uh, misunderstand and uh, those are the uh, passages which may suggest that Kant believed that uh, each appearance or each phenomenon has a, a corresponding noumenon or each sensible object has a, a intelligible being which corresponds to it. So that uh, you, you have the impression that desk is the uh, appearance of the desk in itself, the table is the appearance of the table in itself, or the chair here is uh, the appearance of a chair itself, and the wall is the appearance of the wall itself, or the house we see are uh, the appearance of the house in itself. That's very uh, misleading, but if you have read those those three passages, one from the prolegomena, two from the uh, critique, I mean, you uh, you might get impression appearances are really the uh, appearance of things in themselves. That's why Strauss and H.J. Uh, Payton can say, hey, we don't know things as they are in themselves, we, but we know how things, they appear to us. So, we can understand how they say they make uh, they have their own their own uh, way of reading uh, the relation between things in themselves and appearances. I, I refer to it on page three of my thesis. And now <clears throat> I start with chapter two. In a sense and the self in itself. Mm. Now, I say, in this chapter, I would like to investigate the relation between inner sense and the self in itself. Now, if empirical objects and not things in themselves affect our sense, it should be an empirical subject, the I, and not the self in itself, which affects inner sense. Can the self in itself, a non-sensible being, ever affect sensibility? No. See, the self in itself is not a being but an activity. This is what differentiates Kant from Descartes. For Descartes, there are two substances. Well, there are three substances, maybe you can, well, there's one substance, one infinite substance, that is God, but there are two substances. Uh, the man, human being, is composed of uh, both body and soul. And uh, the, uh, the attribute of the body is extension, and the attribute of the mind is thought. And uh, there are, those are two finite substances. But for Kant, the mind is not a substance, it's not a thing. That's why I say the self in itself, the mind is not a being, but an activity. The mind is not something, the mind is not substance, the mind is not a being, the mind is not, mind, the mind does something but it is not something. That's what Kant says. Now, by its very activity, it synthesizes the given manifold, but it cannot itself be given in sensibility. What cannot be given in sensibility cannot be intuited. See, to, to be known, what to be sensed, it must be given in sensibility. If to, for the mind to be known, it must be uh, given in sensibility. But since the mind is not a, sens a sensible object, there's no way it can be 
give in sensibility. How can you sense a non-sensible being? You can sense sensible objects like desk, table, chair, windows, uh, house, rocks, trees, anything. They're sensible objects. But the mind is not a sensible object. So how can non-sensible object be given sensibility? So that unless we have intellectual intuition, we cannot, we cannot know it. See, only for God, excuse me, for Kant, only God, divine being, has intellectual intuition. Human being has only sensible intuition. And to human being can sense only what is sensible. And I say, <clears throat> when Kant says that the self is affected by its own activity, he does not mean the self is inwardly intuited by itself. He rather means that the activity of the self holds together the manifold intuited outwardly. But now also he says he's affected inwardly. Actually, he's synthesizing what are uh, intuited outwardly. Since the self in itself is a pure formal unity without matter, it cannot provide any material for inner sense. Nothing can be knowledge unless it is composed of both form and matter. So that the self in itself cannot be known. Now, it cannot be known even as it appears for it does not appear at all. Now, <clears throat> as uh, I said, <clears throat> Strauss and H.J. Uh, Payton, we don't know things as they are in themselves, but we know how thing, think things as they appear to us. But the, my point is, the way I read Kant is thing in itself well, the self in itself doesn't even appear. We cannot even know what we are as we appear, because we, our mind, we cannot really know our mind, even, even it appears. It doesn't appear at all. There's a distinction between the self as appearance and the appearance of the self in itself. The former is the phenomenal self, and the latter is the phenomenal aspect of the numeral self. The former, which has the same state as the phenomenal objects, such as trees and rocks, can be known. On the other hand, the latter cannot be known in any way whatsoever. When Kant says that man has no knowledge of himself as his but, merely as he appears to himself, he means knowledge of the self as appearance, not knowledge of the appearance of the self in itself. So, in their dissertation, in the inaugural dissertation he wrote in the 1777, he said that understanding or intelligence knew a uh, intelligible world, namely a uh, numinal world, and uh, sen sensibility knew the sensible world, namely phenomenal world. But after 11 years of uh, thinking and uh, contemplating, he came up with a conclusion that it's not that sensibility knows sensible world and intelligence knows uh, intelligible world. In the Critique of Pure Reason, completed in 1781, his conclusion was that when sensibility and intelligence are employed in conjunction, we know only the sensible world, namely phenomenal world, and we cannot know the intelligible world, numinal world, in any way whatsoever. Now, if this new theory of knowledge were applied to the self, <clears throat> 
it should be that phenomena of self cannot be known, but the numerous of cannot be. Excuse me, the phenomena of self can be known, but the numerous of self cannot be known at, at all. Now this is page six of uh, uh, chapter two. As Kant says, in the synthetic original unity of a perception, I am conscious of myself, not as I appear to myself, nor, nor as I am in myself, but only that I am. I am conscious of my existence, but I don't know who my nature is phenomenal, phenomenal or numerally, because I know that I exist. This is from the Descartes' meditation. He starts uh, his philosophy from doubting. I doubt everything. I might be deceived. I, I might be an idiot. But when I'm wrong, or when I make a huge, mi big mistake, I can't deny I exist. Because I can't even be wrong if I, didn't, I don't even exist. But the gods thought that he was aware not only of his existence, but he, he, he thought he could knew the nature of his uh, self, his, his soul. Kant doesn't think so. Uh, so that uh, even though, for Kant, even though you are conscious of the existence of yourself, you don't really know what you are or who you are. You just don't know the, your nature. You just are conscious of your existence. Thus, there's a distinction between self-consciousness and uh, self-knowledge. Now, uh, the, the some of you might disagree by saying, though we cannot have self-knowledge numinally, we can have self-knowledge phenomenal, phenomenally. In other words, we can have knowledge of the phenomenal self, if not of the numinal self. My answer is that the reader is wrong. I mean, if he means knowledge of the appearance of the numinal self is knowledge of the phenomenal self, See, as it has been repeatedly emphasized in this paper, noumena cannot be given in sensibility, just as noumenal object cannot be intuited outwardly. A noumenal subject, the eye, the mind, cannot be intuited inwardly. Since Kant requires both intuition and concept for knowledge, what cannot be intuited cannot be known. Now, for things to be known, it has to be uh, intuited and conceived, and then it will be known. But what cannot be given in intuition, what cannot be uh, intuited, cannot be, cannot, cannot be known. So, we cannot have knowledge of the phenomenal self. So, now this is page 7. Why then? Does Kant often suggest that knowledge of the self as phenomenon is possible, though knowledge of the self as noumena is impossible? The answer is that knowledge of the self as a phenomenon is possible, but it is possible with knowledge of every other phenomenon in the phenomenal world. Now, this is what, di what distinguishes Kant from Descartes. The Descartes says, mind is better known than the body. We can have knowledge of the mind independent of knowledge of the bodies, things in, se things in space. But Kant says, no, 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 no. We... For Kant, the phenomenal self has the same state as the phenomenal trees and the phenomenal houses. Knowledge of the phenomenal subject cannot be attained without knowledge of phenomenal objects. What we have is the phenomenal knowledge of the self rather than knowledge of the phenomenal self.
knowledge of the phenomenal self sounds as though the no knowledge of the phenomenal self is possible independent of knowledge of phenomenal trees, the phenomenal houses, and so on. Conversely, the former term suggests that self-knowledge inevitably contains knowledge of phenomena in general. The phenomenal knowledge of self is a result of the noumenal self synthesizing a phenomenal manifold received by sensibility. For this knowledge, things outside one, one's own self are necessary. For this knowledge, things outside, namely things in space, bodies in space, the things extended in space are necessary. These things outside me are things in space and not things in themselves, according to the thesis of refutation of idealism. Okay? Now, so, so, some of you might say, hey, ho why do you say fe uh, phenomena in general? I mean, I said, this is page 7, the former term suggests that self-knowledge inevitably contains knowledge of phenomena in general. Now, Kant himself never used the term phenomena in general. I just made up that term, and some people speak against it. But Kant talks about uh, object X or object in general, but he never says phenomena in general. But I, I, so I just made up the, the term phenomenal in general, but what, what I want to say is that to know, even though to, to know myself, to know myself phenomenally, I have to know every other phenomenon in space. I cannot know myself without knowing other things in space. I cannot have knowledge of myself independently of a phenomena. And... Uh, if I want to know myself, my phenomenal self, I have to know every other phenomenon at the same time I try to know myself. So I have to know everything else, no, not the, that every other phenomenon in general. That's why I say phenomena in general. Now, people might, might say, oh, that, that's not a very good way of... Uh, uh, explaining Kant, but I, this is my way of interpreting it. So I said the phenomena in general. Now, the thesis Kant as the second edition of the critique is as follows. The mere but empirically determined consciousness of my own existence proves the existence of, existence of objects in space and time, excuse me, space outside me. <laughs> I, I should not have said time. The consciousness Kant is talking about here is not the transcendental consciousness, but empirical consciousness. Furthermore, as the empirical consciousness is composed of both thought and an empirical manifold, it is a knowledge. As opposed to Descartes, Kant is saying that this knowledge of self includes the knowledge of outer objects. For Descartes, the mind is better known than the bodies. On the contrary, on the contrary, for Kant, the mind is not any better known than the bodies. Kant says that we can be a, a human being can be empirically aware of himself only in time, and the determination of time is possible only with a change among the things in sp space, namely bodies. It is that outer experience is really immediate and that only by means of it, it is inner experience possible. Inner experience does not tell us how the noumenal self is intuited by inner sense, but it tells us how the noumenal self synthesizes outer objects intuited by outer sense within the realm of time, which is the, is the form of inner sense. Thus, the uh, phenomenal knowledge of self is at the same time the knowledge of outer things, the mind, the self cannot be known independently of the body's, i.e., extended things in space. <laughs>
it is very important to notice that when Kant says, I know myself as I appear to myself, he does not mean I know, my, I know myself as myself is intuited, as myself in itself is intuited, sensible by inner sense. Myself can never be intuited because it's not a sensibly, sensible being. On the contrary, although an inner object is not intuited sensibly, an outer object is intuited sensibly. In other words, an outer object is a sensible being and not an intelligible being. The reader might get an impression that a thing outside one's own self is a thing in itself when he reads the passage. Thus, perception of this permanent is possible only through a thing outside me and not through the mere representation of a thing outside me. Now, the reader might regard a thing outside me as a thing in itself and the mere representation of a thing outside me as the appearance of a thing in itself. This is misleading. As I briefly showed at the bottom of page 7, as Kant himself states in A373, this is what I said at the end of lecture 1. Uh, A373 was uh, in the parologism, not the transcendental deduction of categories. Um, thus, when Kant says, a thing outside me, he means a thing in space, not a thing in itself. Furthermore, the mere representation of a thing outside me means the representation of uh, representation. This is a theory of double affection. Now, Professor Robert Wolf, Paul Wolf, who directed my thesis and who was a uh, uh, who gave a very good series on the lecture of uh, Critique of Pure Reason. I, I think he's made nine lectures on the Critique of Pure Reason three years ago. Now, in his book, Kant's Theory of Mental Activity, which was published in 1963 from Harvard, well, that's a very good book. I mean, it was published like even three years before Strawson's Bounds of Sense. And now, in Kant's theory of mental activity, uh, Bob Wolf says, Kant sought a way of preserving the distinction between unconditioned reality and conditioned experience while further allowing a distinction within the realm of experience between perception and object. In his own terms, he wished to distinguish the transcendentally real things in themselves the empirically real objects and the empirical ideal perceptions. The empirical real can be substituted for a thing outside me and the empirical ideal can be substituted for the mere representation of a thing outside me. The empirically real is the empirical cause and the empirical ideal is the empirical effect. Moreover, Outer sense is affected by empirical cause. On the other hand, inner sense is not affected by empirical cause. Why then does Kant use the term affection for both outer sense and inner sense? In my view, Kant himself has to be blamed for a careless use of the term affection. Inner sense is not affected in the same way the retina of an eye is affected by a visible object. Inner sense is not affected by the empirical real. It is not affected by the transcendental real either. When inner said sense is said to be affected, it synthesizes what affects outer sense. Inner sense is affected only immediately, though outer sense is affected immediately. To be strict, inner sense is not intuition since intuition must be, according to Kant's definition, in immediate relation to objects. See? For Kant, intuition is in immediate relation to uh, objects. Outer sense is in immediate 
relation to objects, outer objects. But in a sense, it's not. Now, today, uh, I mostly read my uh, uh, own writing uh, so that uh, it, about chapter one, I just, I just, I just spoke, I just talked. But uh, today, I spend more time reading than uh, uh, presenting my own interpretations. But uh, I think uh, lecture three, instead of uh, uh, giving a lecture on chapter three, I will go over chapter two, which I read today, and uh, I'm going to read, uh, uh, you know, chapter pass passage by passage, or line by line, and I will explain uh, what I meant uh, in my uh, next lecture. So uh, I uh, hope to see you again in about two weeks. I think uh, I'll give uh, my lecture maybe uh, every other week, if not every week. I mean, if I give you a lecture once a month, I mean, there will be, uh, if you wait for a month, you don't want to wait for a month, but I can't really give a lecture every week. So I say, I'll give you a lecture uh, every other week from now on. So I, I'll probably give uh, two lectures in August. Uh, the review of chapter two, and uh, also on uh, ch chapter three. Chapter three is uh, time and the uh, phenomenal self. That's page 11 of my thesis. And uh, as I repeatedly have said, I really am assuming that uh, you have read the critique of pure reason, or, or you don't understand everything, but uh, I also assume you have my thesis, Kant's philosophy of, of the self, which went on the internet two years ago on April 5th, and uh, more than 6,000 people uh, have read it. And if you have, you don't have, you, you've never read the critique of pure reason, and you, you don't have my thesis with you, it will be very difficult for you to understand what I'm saying in this uh, uh, series of lectures. So please have my thesis written in uh, more than 30 years ago, but it's, it's still good. So uh, I hope to see you in about uh, two weeks from now.